So thank you everybody for coming along to this middle part of the Discovery Day. Um, you've, you've heard what it was saying tonight, and now we're going to talk about how we get to that point and where we're going next. And we're here as part of the Remembering Bunting Festival. And so we need to talk a little bit about Bunting and his role in interacting with the Harpers. Am I too far away from the machine? Oh yeah. Bunting was a classical musician, and this is very important because sometimes, it, sometimes we get all these different aspects mixed up, but primarily he was a classical musician, he was a church organist. This is the ancient organ key keyboard, the 18th century organ console in the church in Drogheda, where Edward Bunting's brother, Anthony, was the organist. And when he was a young boy, Edward went to Drogheda to study classical music with Anthony. And so I'm sure Edward would have played on these keys when he was, when he was very young. And Bunting was also a pianist. And I, I'm not sure if he learned of the cathedral choristers in Armagh where he was born or what, but he had, this, he had this very good classical music training in the church, keyboard, organ, piano kind of world. Now in 1792, the learned gentleman of Belfast at the, at the Linen Hall Library organized a gathering of Irish harpers. The, the idea of, of the gentleman there was to preserve the ancient national music of Ireland. It was a patriotic and educational and cultural project. And so they, they organized to advertise to all the harpers in Ireland to get them to come. And this is part of their original advertisement. It's in the, it's in the Beth collection, in the, the Beth collection in the Linen Hall Library. And they advertise, you can see at the top, for a skillful musician to transcribe and arrange the music of the harpers. And it's a complicated story, but the skillful musician who eventually came was Edward Bunting. Oh, I pressed the wrong button. Press hundreds of buttons. <laughs> okay. So the meeting was at the assembly rooms. <laughs> the meeting was at the assembly rooms. And um, over three days, I think, and Bunting <coughs> came to the assembly room, and many fashionable Belfast people, and the Harpers. And they all were there in the upstairs room, and the harpers played, and Bunting listened, and the fashionable ladies and gentlemen chatted amongst themselves and were see, to see and be seen. Now the harpers were, um, the old harpers were from a different world. They were rural, Irish speaking, complete opposite end of Irish life from the urban, cosmopolitan, Anglo world of the town of Belfast. And these harpers, all of, who, all of these harpers were at Belfast at Festival in 1792, and they represent the end of a long tradition of indigenous Irish harp playing. And these men, they were, they were mostly men, were the uh, last generation to play the harp in Ireland in the indigenous Irish harp tradition. The youngest of all is the lad at the bottom right, William Carr. He was just, a, how old was he, 15 years old in 1792. And he had been taught to play the harp by Patrick Quinn, the man at the bottom left, and also by Arthur O'Neill, the man top left. So, you, so that we have, even in this last generation, there's more than one generation, if you like. The man top right is Dennis O'Hampsey, and he was another generation older. He was almost 100 years old at this point. But still, these men were the last cohorts to play the old Irish harp in the old indigenous tradition. And so our work 
with the Heart Society and individually is to try and discover more about this heart tradition. And so how do we do that? What are our processes to rediscover this lost tradition? So we can start with the people. Here's Arthur O'Neill, sitting under a tree. It's a very beautiful picture, very atmospheric and characterful. And he's got a very distinctive profile and haircut. And we can kind of recognize him in other pictures. Now, Edward Bunting, I think he got on quite well with Arthur O'Neill. And he, he often refers to information from Arthur O'Neill. I think Arthur O'Neill was like a raconteur and a storyteller and uh, a bit egotistical. And so he would chatter away and tell Bunting things, and Bunting would write them down. And so this is a sheet in Belfast Central Library, and Bunting has drawn little sketch pen portraits of Arthur O'Neill, and he's captioned them. On the left hand, it says, thinking. And then, I don't know what the middle one is. Is this Arthur O'Neill with his head shaved? You know, Bunting being irreverent, because of course, poor Arthur was blind and couldn't see what Bunting was doing. And then on the right, we have laughing or smiling. And there's a little speech bubble. And Arthur O'Neill says, Mick, how does my coat fit me? And Mick was his manservant. Because all the heart would travel with a manservant and carry the heart and go. I don't know if that's Mick in the middle. It might be. And then at the top of the page, we've got names of Harpers. He's written Hempson, Quinn, Higgins, Black, Fanning, Keenan. Duncan, Byrne, Rose Mooney, Kate Martin, O'Shea of Tralee. And I don't know if this is Arthur O'Neill telling Bunting the names of Harper who are interesting or important that he should look up. And then Bunting went even further, and he commissioned one of his secretaries, Thomas Hughes, to take down from Arthur O'Neill's dictation the memoirs or autobiography of Arthur O'Neill. And there are two separate copies of this, like first copy and then a second revised copy that Arthur O'Neill made with Thomas Hughes. And they're both at Queen <coughs> University of Belfast in the Maclay Library. And they're both online, so you can read the whole books online. And they've both been transcribed as well. Um, and so this is the beginning of Arthur O'Neill's autobiography. And he says, Memoirs of Arthur O'Neill. I was born in Drummond <coughs> Stad, near Dungannon, in the county of Tyrone. My father and mother were both called O'Neill. Their fathers and mothers' names were O'Neill, and so on he goes, with his great long genealogical thing about how he was not a single ancestor who wasn't called O'Neill. So he's quite full of himself, you know? But it's a, it's a great read, and it's full of anecdotes and ridiculous stories, and practical jokes, and memories of all the different old harpers. So I highly recommend you go onto the Queen's website and have a look at Arthur O'Neill's memoirs. This, I told you there were two versions. This is, this is the first version. This is much more rougher. This is, a, this is like a much more high-speed graph. And um, just last year, the Queen's Library started digitizing this. And they put up on the social media part of this page um, a little scratchy thing in the bottom left-hand page. And I'd never seen that before. And if you turn it over, it's a little sketch of Arthur O'Neill with his half. And I just thought, that's so sweet. You get a real personal connection with these people through, through this through these documents. OK, and Arthur O'Neill, we have harps that are traditionally said to be, have belonged to him or to have been played by him. So this is a harp. It's in the Ulster Museum upstairs with all the military and United Irishmen displays. Um, I think you can see this is not the same harp as in the portrait. So, so I don't know if this harp actually belonged to Arthur O'Neill. But if it did, it's not the one he's playing in the portrait. And I think it might not be, but how do you tell? It's very difficult. <coughs> There's another harp that's traditionally connected to him. This one is now in London in the Victorian Albert Museum. Um, but it comes, they, they got it from Seagull and they put it down. And again, I don't know if, this, if the connection is spurious or real, but you can see at least it has a similar kind of shape. It has the little scroll at the top turning back. Although there are other differences as well. So, so, so we can't be certain about these connections. There are lots of old harps. This is a collection of, of um, old harps in the National Museum in Dublin. Um, 
you can see that they're all different. There's no two that are the same. And yet, if we look, start looking at this collection, we can see that they have, there are things that they have in common. They're all quite large, <laughs> this kind of size of the ground. They all have metal strings on them. Usually, most of them brass wire strings. They don't have any mechanical mechanisms or levers or stops to change the pitch of the string. So they don't have any semitones. They play just a diatonic scale, a bit like the white notes of a piano. And they don't have any feet to make them stand up. And so this is a completely different world to classical pedal and lever harps. Classical harps, harps in the, in the Anglo-European classical tradition have gut strings which are colour coded so you play them visually and they have mechanisms at the top or with the pedals at the bottom, the mechanisms which change the strings and make sharps and flats. So that's the classical world, the key changes and that soft, round, plummy sound that we think of with classical harps. But these are not part of that world. These are a completely different world, an Irish world in complete contrast to the Anglo-classical. So the Irish harps with metal strings and that sort of strict diatonical tuning with no sharps and flats. And some of these harps from the National Museum are ones that we have copies of here. This, this big one here is a copy of the harp on top right. This one here is a harp, copy of the harp on top left. There are other old harps. This is a harp that's kept in the Guinness Museum in Dublin. This is a copy of it. And this harp is traditionally said to have belonged to Dennis Ahamsey. We saw, his, we saw Dennis Ahamsey's portrait earlier. And here's Edward Bunting in one of his notebooks writing out the tuning schedule of this harp, and that's very interesting from a musical point of view, because now suddenly you don't just have a harp that's all twangy and out of tune, you have the, the names of the notes that go with it. And here's Dennis Hampsey sitting with his harp. And if you look backwards and forwards between the portrait of a Hampsey and the harp, I think you can see that they really are the same instrument. The, the, the thing that catches people out is that the harp on the left has a big, beaky animal head, and the harp on the right doesn't. But if you go to the Guinness Museum and look at the harp there, you'll see that there's a big crack where the head has come off and has been stuck <coughs> back on. So don't worry about the animal head. Look at the other things. Look at the little roses. Look at the little curls on the top. You, you can see this, this is the harp. This harp in Guinness is the one that Dennis Hamps is playing. So that's kind of, that's a fun little thing you can do, is try and match up little bits, fragments of the story. <coughs> Here's another harp in the Dublin Museum. This one's in Trinity College, and it's not on display. They, they have it as a kind of reserve harp, so that when the famous Brian Baru harp is being cleaned, this one can come out. I think that's how it works. But, uh, but you, can, you can make an appointment to see it if you're, if you're interested. And um, this one is traditionally said to have belonged to Patrick Quinn. And here's the portrait of Patrick Quinn. And again, if you look backwards and forwards between the harp and the portrait, I think you can see they really are the same object. You can see every little detail on the portrait matches the details on the harp. So that's very exciting. And it's a beautiful harp. It's painted and carved and decorated and very well made. And it's a beautiful portrait. It's very characterful, characterful and expressive portrait of a harp. And I think this is the perhaps the best portrait we have of one of the old harpers to show their to show their personality and their harp and everything. So that's great. You can get a, a sense of the kind of research we can do. We can go to museums and look at harp and portraits and the anecdotes and the information. We've got all this information. And we can learn a lot about the old Irish harp traditions. But well, suppose we want to do more than that and hear it and play it and get it up and running again. Well, the first thing we need is to get hold of a harp. And bear in mind that we don't want a classical harp to play 
the old Irish harp and you become you know, old Irish harp with metal strings and everything, just like when it's a happy scene, a happy queen harp. So here's an old Irish harp. This harp is supposed to have been one of the ones that belongs to Turk Caravan. There's more than one harp that, was, that belonged to him, and they're probably all true, because why would you only have one harp? But this is one of Caroline's houses. It belongs to the National Museum in Dublin. And I think you can see that it's not possible to tune and play this harp. It's too fragile, it's too old, it's too broken, it's too rare. You have to wear protective gloves to even inspect it. It's kept in a special climate-controlled storeroom in the museum with these soft pads and cushions for it to rest on because it's so old and valuable and fragile. So this is me in the museum inspecting it and discussing technical aspects of it. <coughs> the museum agreed that we could have the harp scanned, so it's a laser scanner came in and they did a, a 3D scan of the, of the harp and you end up with um, a 3D model of the harp that you can view online and you can rotate and twist and turn it to any angle you can look at the harp from whatever angle you like, like from the top you can cut a slice through it, you can see the section of the sound board, you can get as much technical plans and templates as you like and you can give those te templates and plans to a harp maker who can use that as blueprints to make a new harp. And you can see here on the left, he's gluing together the big pieces of wood to make the frame of the harp. And on the right, he's carving the sound box out of a big single log of wood hollowed out from behind. So it starts as a tree trunk and it ends up like an eggshell, it's a fine and thin, all following the data that you get in the museum from inspecting the original. And then once you have the new harp, you, you fit strings onto it, brass, wire, strings. You can see the reels, of, different reels of brass and fitting onto the new harp. And then you can tune it with the, with, with the scheme that, we, that Bunting gives us to go to Hampstead. And the special thing about that tuning is not only is, do you have a run of notes with no sharps and no flats, but in the middle of the harp are two tuned to the same note. And Bunting explains in great length in his books about these two strings called Macaulay. In, Eng in English they're called the sisters, so they're a little bit more polite and discreet. And they're both t tuned to G, and they're the first tunes that you, strip you tune when you tune the harp. And um, lots of information about alternative names and that kind of thing. And, they, and they're, they're perhaps the most distinctive thing about the old Irish harp, the metal strings. And then Nicoli tuning. And then at the end of that process of research and documentation and making and stringing and tuning, this is what you end up with new harps, which are exact working copies of the old Irish harps in the museums. And we can use these new harps to learn the old playing to, you can play them in a way that, we, you know, you can't in the museum, but here in the classroom, there are the harps, you can pick them up, you can play them. You can learn the old playing techniques and you can hear the old sounds of the, of the old metal strong Irish harp. So far so good, you have an instrument, you have it strung, you have it tuned, you can touch the strings and hear it sound, but what music do you play? How do you play music? Or how do you learn music? Or where do you find music? And not just what tunes, but what style and what idiom and in how do you play tunes? What should the sound of the old harp music be like? Wouldn't it be great if we could go to a master musician, a tradition bearer in the old Irish harp tradition? and learn from them. We could go to Dennis Hampsey and we could sit beside him in his cottage and he could teach us, he could, he could show us how to play the harp, how it sounds, the textures and the richness of sound and the spareness and the flow of the tune and the ornaments and the bass notes and everything. But he's dead. 
and has been for 200 years. So that's not going to work. But Edward Bunting went to the middle again and sat beside Dennis Hampsey in his cottage. So this is, this is our this is our way in. Okay, Bunting's our angel. So basically, Bunting had listened to the old harpers in, in Belfast, and I don't, I don't actually know if he wrote any tunes down in Belfast at all, or if he did, we don't have them, but he certainly wanted more. And so he set off touring around the north of Ireland, and we know he went to McGilligan, and we know he went to other places and met other harpers. He traveled out into the countryside to find the old harpers in their cottages or big houses. So he went to McGilligan in County Derry to visit Dennis Hampsey. And Dennis Hampsey played, and as Hampsey played, Edward Bunting jotted down the tune in his little pocket notebook. And this little notebook is preserved in Queens in the McClay Library. And that's a great treasure to have the, to have the dots, to have the jotting. So let's look a little closer at these jottings in the little notebooks and see how this can help us. This is a page from that notebook in the McClay Library, and it has a tune that Bunting collected from Dennis Hampsey in McGilligan. Um, most of you are at the concert, and this is the Lady of the Desert, which is a long way. <coughs> So, Bunting takes the little notebook full of tunes back home with him to Belfast. <coughs> and he sits down at the piano. Because remember, Bunting's a classical musician, he's a keyboard player, he's an organist. That's the first thing that he can do. So he sits down at the piano and he makes a piano arrangement. This is what he comes up with. What, he's what Bunting's trying to do is he's sitting at his piano, a, a little old square piano like this, and he's, and he's looking at the, what it, the dots that he got from Dennis Hampsey, and he's trying to make sense of it, trying to knock it into shape. So I think you can see what he's doing. If you look at the top line of the, of the main manuscript, he's copying the tune down from the, from the, from the notebook, and he's inventing a piano bass. He's, he's basically making a harmonic arrangement of it. But there, where there's, where there's a whole mess of notes in the little notebook, they turn into, he copies them into bass notes in the piano. Siobhan talks to you about how he wrote these bass notes that Hampsey played. And so Bunting incorporates them into his piano arrangements. But he's also composing new harmonies and making a new piano arrangement. And I think it's quite obvious in lots of the tunes, lots of the old Irish harp tunes are not very harmonic. And so, as Bunting composes his piano harmonies, he tweaks the tune to fit onto the chord progression nicer. And so the tunes gradually, the tune, but not even gradually, very quickly move away from harp style and into piano style. But that's fine, because Bunting's a pianist, and that's what he, that's what he wanted to do. Remember the notice right at the beginning, the gentleman wanted their skillful musician to transcribe and arrange the music. Okay. So this is, this is the world we're going towards. And the aim of all this work is to print it and publish it so that it can be sent out to all the drawing rooms of the empire and everybody, all the amateur ladies and gentlemen of their piano forties can play the ancient Irish music. And that will keep it alive. This was the plan. And it kind of worked because these books are quite common. Of course, after Bunting died, his notebooks vanished disappeared into the family into an attic somewhere. And they were found in the attic of a descendant about just a hundred years ago, and they were present, presented to Queens, where they've been ever since. And so for the last hundred years, scholars have gone to Queens and have worked on the Bunting Collection and looked at the manuscripts and to try and understand what's behind those printed, published piano arrangements. But I think, I think a lot of this, these scholars, going right back to the beginnings of the scholarship 100 years ago, didn't really realize 
or didn't realize the implication of it still being classical piano music. Okay. The, the manuscripts in Queen's are very, very rich collection. Uh, there's so many tunes, so many manuscripts, and it's very disorganized because it's just boxes where Bunting chucked his notes as he finished working with them. And so looking through these piano manuscripts is really interesting and is a huge resource for studying Bunting's piano process and for studying the development of romantic piano arrangements of Irish tunes and for studying the rise of national music and all these kind of things. And they also are very interesting for learning about the harpers because a lot of them contain little tags. So you can see this big manuscript, number 51, Coolin or Lady of the Desert, very ancient. So Bunting's putting information about the age of the tune. And at the bottom he says, get the words from Mrs. Connor. So it's a little note to himself. Is it get or got? So he, he either wants to go to Mrs. Connor to get the words of this song, or he already has got them and they're in a different manuscript. Of his. But that's information for us. We can look up Mrs. Connor, we can see what kind of a singer was she, other manuscripts that have words from her, etc. So the, the piano arrangements can give us metadata and tags that we can chase as part of this research. But it's still classical piano music. We haven't yet got back to the sound of the old Irish harpers. But if we get rid of all the piano arrangements, we find something that is not Bunting's piano arrangement, that is not classical music. But, so what is this? I would stick my neck out and say that this is basically traditional Irish harp music. And you can qualify that in all kinds of ways, but we don't have hours, so I'll not. But what Bunting's doing is this, this page represents Bunting sitting beside Dennis Hamsey, and as Dennis Hamsey plays, Bunting writes. And he writes at speed as the harper plays. And so Bunting is not engaging his brain here and thinking, oh, I wonder if that chord progression or it's rhythm go. He's literally responding in real time to the music of the harpers. And this is a, I chose this one because it's neat and complete, but there's plenty of pages in the manuscripts that are just a line of dots. And actually, those are the most interesting because they're the ones that have zero bunting piano classical inputs. It's like automatic writing. He hears and he dots. And of course, there are to be work with as well, but there you go. It's important, looking at this, we've been talking about how huge the bunting collection is, how many tunes there are. It's important to realize that not all the music in bunting's manuscripts is harp music. In this little manuscript 29, the little pocket notebook, I reckon about a third of that book is harp tunes. And the other two thirds is not harp music. It's about 15% is tunes that Bunting has copied from printed books or from other manuscripts. And half or more is copied from pipers, singers, fiddlers. We originally talked about that there are all these songs in the Bunting manuscript. But yes, because Bunting collected tunes, from, he sought out singers, he sought out pipers, he sought out collectors who had old books and old manuscripts with printed Irish tunes. And he just tried, he was trying to get Irish tunes from any source possible. And the harpers were just an interesting, rich, and useful source. So one of the tasks that, that I've been working on a lot recently is how do you tell whether a tune is a harp tune or a song air or a fiddle tune? How do you tell if it is written down live in the playing of a harper or if it has been copied to a printed book or, some, or if it's a start of a piano arranging process? And we could, we, could have spend, we could take a three hour break and argue about this page and how much of this is bunting thinking classically and how much is no, his naive, straight transcription of what the harp was playing. It's a, it's a huge subject area. And there are hundreds and hundreds of tunes. I reckon there's about 250 transcriptions written live from the playing traditional musicians. And probably half of those, so, you know, a hundred or more, are written live from the playing of harpers. So that's a huge body of work. And it can take weeks to look at each one. So if we start now, we might be done in 10 years' time. Well, we won't because we'll be arguing the whole time. (laughs) 
Okay, so we've identified <coughs> traditional Irish harp music. We've identified what is traditional Irish harp music. How do we use that to recreate or rediscover or reimagine the lost Irish harp tradition? So it's no use just taking this and playing it on the piano. That's what bunting did. So that's been done 200 years ago, and it's lovely, but it gives you classical piano music. It's no use playing on a classical harp with a classical harp set up with gut strings and semitone mechanisms and played on the right side of the right hand of the treble it's in, in the Anglo classical setup. Because that's the same Anglo classical classical music world as a piano, and it'll take it would take us in the same kind of direction for you. And what we want to do is not to reimagine this music in a, in a classical, common practice kind of framework. That we want to, to get close to the old Irish harp tradition. So, we can take the transcription and we can look at the portrait of Dennis O'Hansi. And then we can look at the way he's holding his harp, look at the way he's holding his hands on the harp. And then look at the notation and think, how do those hand shapes match the patterns of notes in the transcription? I mean, you can't take it literally, but it's not, this is not a photograph of him playing while that was being done. But you know, we don't have video archives that it's actually playing. Have to, this is all we've got. We have to do the best we can. So you can start to imagine this. Look at the separation of the hands. Look at the separation of notes in the registers in the transcription. These kind of questions, you can start to think. How does how does it actually work? How is he actually playing? Look at how he sits. Look at how he places his fingers on the strings. Look at the different shapes of his hand. Look at the way his left hand is curled on the treble. Look at the way his right hand is spread out across the bass strings. He's not looking at the strings, or he's not looking at his hands, and he's not looking at his fingers because he's blind. So that tells us something about his working method and his playing style as well. And then, of course, I've talked about how he puts his fingers on the harp. Well, we can look at his harp, and we can try and see. Look at where his hand was touching the side. Can you see it? Do you think it's more shiny? Do you think it's more shiny where his knee's touching it? Do, is, there, is there physical cues in the instrument that can help guide us how we, how we put, up, put our hands? Except we can't actually go to Genesis and sit down with his harp and play it because it's too old and fragile and broken. But we can... We can send it off to our heart maker and they can make an exact copy that works in exactly the same way with the string with brass strings and tune it with the same tuning with the sister string from the Corey. And we can use that. <coughs> Just the same as what Dennis Hampsey has to copy his posture and to play the notes that Edward Bunting wrote, stream of consciousness, as a direct response from his playing. <coughs> and so this is our method that we're using this is, this is how we are rediscovering the old Irish harp music the transcriptions in the manuscripts in London's manuscripts in Queens the portraits of the harpers to show us posture, orientation hand position, finger shapes and the, old, uh, the replica the accurate working replica of the old harp strung and set up according to the instructions. And those three things together, you can, can go a long way with just that. That's it.